however, all this is very serious today. You know, all lives matter to God. All lives matter to God. I'm going to talk about today how the mess in the USA can be fixed. How it can be definitively fixed. I'm not guessing. I'm not ifing and anning and button, but how all lives can be definitively fixed. Now, I opened the newspaper this morning. I gleaned from uh, some of the news articles, stories, various stories about yesterday's shooting in Dallas, Texas, which, as you know, a sniper killed five police officers and following a couple days where, I guess it was in Louisiana and in Minnesota, where uh, uh, various black people, two black men, were shot by police, different police officers. Anyways... At the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial in Washington, D.C., comes this news report. Uh, Kim Hernandez welled with tears Friday as she took stock of this week. She said this, There's just a really scary sense of humanity right now, she said. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how we can fix it. But it doesn't seem like talking is working. Well, I know how we can fix it. I, I, I do. And I'm, I have absolute confidence that what I'm going to be talking about today can fix the problem in the U.S. of A. Now, that's a very bold statement to say. And I'm stating it categorically. So listen in. Listen to the end of, of this particular message, and you'll hear exactly why. And I, I bet you probably will agree with me. There is also one of the other things I saw in the news today. Uh, Janine Bell, an Indiana University professor who authored, she, she did this book, Policing Hatred, Law Enforcement, Civil Rights, and Hate Crime, said uh, the week, well, this week, this past week, which was traumatic, I mean, we heard it even here in Canada, all in the news, was, was, would not go down as a pivotal point unless it leads to substantive change. Substantive change change. In this, she's right. You know, everything that's gone on won't lead to a substantive change unless something does happen. Now, this particular uh, university uh, professor, Janine Bell, you know, she says it's, uh, it goes beyond. I mean, she's focusing on a few specific diversifying uh, police forces, introducing anti-bias training, she says, until there's a call for reorganization of police practices, not just small changes, it'll be very hard to call this a turning point, she said. She's missing the big picture. She's only looking at, really, one side of the equation, okay? And anyone knows that if you're going to solve a complicated equation, you have to work both sides. <laughs> you really do. Any mathematician knows that. Now, there was a comment on some of these stories that I was reading about. I guess this comment was on the National Post website on one story about it. And the comment, the, re the reader said this, and I, I, I thought this was interesting. He said, I'm not weeping, he said. I'm angry. Angry at the scum who are killing cops. Angry at the scum cops using excessive force. Angry at politicians exploiting the situation for personal gain or, for, or per political gain. Angry at a present, president fomenting it all. People are dying so Obama and the left can perpetuate an agenda of taking our rights and liberty. You know, many of the news stories said that, you know, what's going on in the USA this past week just is highlighting a division in America. We all know America is divided. We all know that. I mean, politically we know it, but there's, there's two, different, two different really halves of the country. Let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. Where are we right now? Where are we? What is happening? You know, the Kim Hernandez says I, she's getting a really scary sense of humanity right now. Well, she should have a scary sense. And if you have any brains in your head whatsoever and are looking at the news, you'll also be concerned. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. I'm going to read this in the Amplified Bible version. 
But understand this, okay, the Apostle Paul is writing to his younger minister's uh, helper, Timothy. He said, understand this, that in the last days, okay, this is a prophetic reference. Most people don't think of prophecy in the New Testament or in the New Covenant Scriptures, but indeed there is. Paul said, understand this, that in the last days, dangerous times or times of great stress and trouble will come. That means that these days are going to be difficult to bear. Verse 2, for people will be lovers of self. The me generation, have you heard about that? Narcissistic, self-focused, self-absorbed. Does that describe us right now? Oh, you bet it does. Lovers of money, this gets even better, doesn't it? Impelled by greed. Oh, yes, we think right now in this 21st century that greed is good. I mean, we hear it all the time. Boastful arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, and profane. Okay, so if it was just these things up to chapter 2, we'd say, well, that, that's just normal good stuff. I mean, part of the do-it-yourself do generation, do your own thing. Verse 3, but there's problems with this attitude, okay? Verse 3, and they will be un loving the scriptures say unloving that is devoid of natural human affection they're going to be they're going to be calloused they're going to be inhumane that's what unloving means inhumane calloused you can blow away you know five guys you know who are out there doing their jobs you think about their families think about their loved ones go up and, you know, be too fast on the trigger doing your job. You know, what's, what's, you know, what's with this person's lives? What's going on? Irreconcilable. This is interesting. This is strong 786. This Greek word is aspandos. That means, you know, it's kind of an interesting word. It's where they translate it irreconcilable. It literally means without a libation sacrifice. The understanding was it was used when you made a treaty in the ancient world or a covenant, you would pour out a drink offering. Okay, and so these people, you know, they're without the ability to, to, to unable to please, unable to placate somebody else, to unable to compromise, to get along, to make a treaty of peace. They're unable. They're irreconcilable. You've heard of irreconcilable differences. You know, marriages is one of the prime reasons for uh, divorce, of course. Then the next one comes is malicious gossips malicious gossips we live in the age of social media boy malicious gossip travels by this you know the speed of electricity it's amazing how fast it goes devoid of self-control which a which the amplified says this means you know intemperate inclined to excess immoral well, isn't that all the things that go on? Some of the things? You look at what's going on. Inclined to excess? Oh, yeah. We see plenty of that. The next one is brutal. Strong's uh, 434. Animeros. You know, fierce. Savage. People are brutal. Haters of good. Traitors. Reckless. Conceited. Lovers of sensual pleasure rather than lovers of God. Oh, this describes our times. This describes our times. Oh, you bet. Watch TV. <laughs> Holding a form of outward godliness, that is, of, of the outward form of true religion, although they have denied its power. Oh, yeah. You know, nine in ten people in America say they believe in God. You know, it's one of the most, you know, uh, one of the nations where the church attendance is the highest and people say, oh, yeah, they're this, that, and the other. They, you know, they have an outward form of godliness, although they have denied its power, which the Amplified says, for their conduct nullifies their claim of faith. You know, modern Christianity is practiced in the Western world is one that, you know, we, we, you know, they talk almost endlessly about grace and the law is done away. It's a, it's, 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 as one preacher says, it's a lawless grace. The Apostle Paul's conclusion here, this little section to Timothy, his fellow minister, who was what? 
he said, avoid such people and keep far away from them. No, you don't want to cozy up with people like this. You really don't. You know, it's the old story, a rotten apple will sparrow the whole barrel. And that's what's happening. In a lot of communities, I don't care where you are, you've got, a, you've got a pile of rotten apples and they're spoiling the rest of the barrel. And that's what's happening throughout the country in the United States of America. Now, also from the news media, I picked this one up, a Bible Way Temple. That's an interesting name for um, uh, a church, but Bible Way Temple. Okay, good. He likes to, he puts the Bible up front. They should. Okay, the Bible Way Temple in Raleigh, North Carolina. Dar Darnell Dixon Sr., the chief pastor, and I believe this is probably a black church, if you know, most of the people who attend there. I mean, I'm just guessing here from the little bit I know about the American South. But Darnell Dixon Sr., the chief pastor, wondered why more positive change hasn't come. Anybody like myself, and I have a feeling uh, if he's calling himself senior, it's because he's got a junior. <laughs> and so he's a little bit older. We've lived through a certain number of things. We saw what happened in the 1960s and then the 70s. We saw what happened in the various riots that took place, even out in California. I think it was 92 year after I left California in LA. Anyways, <clears throat> Pastor Dixon presided over the funeral of another black man who was shot by a white officer earlier this year and was part of a dialogue with police that followed and brought him a sense of healing. I started feeling better, he said, but yesterday set me back. It bewildered me. Yeah, there are. I guess in the United States, something like uh, on an average, you know, currently in this current statistic, something like 450 black men are killed by police officers every year. But just to let you know, about twice as many white people are killed by police officers. So it's not like they're not killing, you know, that's all, that's it. Every single life matters. It doesn't, you know, if, if, you, if, you're, if you're shot and killed because a guy's too fast on the draw, that's, you know, that's a tragedy. The officer, you know, should be disciplined and dealt with, okay, from that standpoint. One of the other stories that I read in the, in the paper it was entitled, The Mood, The Mood, When Rice and Guns Collide. And here they quoted from the mayor of Dallas, Texas, okay, where this shooting occurred where the five police officers were, were snipered. And, and he said his generation of leaders have failed to solve old wounds that festered for centuries. He urged everyone to choose their words carefully over the next while, which was smart. Because a lot of people have been spouting off and saying things that are just going, it's just like, throw, you know, it's like throwing Girl Scout water on a fire. <laughs> you know, throwing gasoline on a fire. We must love one another, he said. Because if we don't, this cancer of separatism will kill this body. Now, there is a cancer of separatism that is building up in the United States. It's, it's been affecting, it's been really hitting the black community in particular. And I would say, as a minister of Jesus Christ, stay away from the Black Lives Matter and the new Black Panther movements, because they're separatist movements. Stay away from paramilitary groups, militias, and the KKK. <laughs> these people are separatists and, and they're thinking. You know, Church of God pastors, you know, I, I know this from a fact because I've been around long enough. During the 1960s and 70s, when they were posted in the American South, they had problems. Because we had in our congregations black people and white people and people of, you know, of other places. And you know we would have we would have social events together and do things. We would go and help each other and move and do stuff. We would take care of the widows. It didn't matter what color the the you know the person was who needed help. We helped them. And this sometimes put us in various people's bad books. <laughs> it really did. 
Now, I remember one of our chief pastors, we had a church college at that point in time, and then some people said, well, you should have a different college for the colored people, okay, for the people who are of, of you know, who, who are people of color, we say now, but, in, you know, in the old days, they say colored people. That's just like the signs they used to have, you know, in the segregation day, you know, colored bathroom, colored waiting room. I saw it all. Well, I did. I saw even the Klan march in town. I saw the old hanging tree where they would lynch them. You know, there were plenty of things that, that were wrong. But the society, you know, they were saying to this pastor general, they said, well, we need to have a separate college, you know, for the colored people. But he eventually rejected the idea. He really did. Let's go to Galatians 3 and verse 25. I'm going to show you why. This man of God rejected that idea. Why he rejected separatism, okay? Let's go to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 25. And I'm going to cite this in the Coulter Bible, all right? The Coulter Bible. Galatians 3, 25. The Epistles of Paul, of course, written to the church in Galatia. But since the faith, now I don't know if your translation has this. Actually, Coulter doesn't have that. I, I, when my studies, I, I noticed the faith has the definite article. It actually should be translated because in there it is the faith, okay, in the Greek text. But since the faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Well, the Greek word is pedagogos. When the faith has come, we are no longer under this pedagogos, which was a boy's guardian. It was a slave who had charge of the life and morals of the boys of the family. He wasn't strictly a teacher. He was the disciplinarian. You know, when dad wasn't around, the pedagogos kept him in line. You know, you're not going to do this, you're going to do that. You're going to show up where you're supposed to go in time and all this other stuff. Okay, because they expected the boys to be disciplined. They needed them, so they would have a slave specifically set aside for that. You talk in Roman, Greco-Roman society, you know, from this story, it was usually a Greek slave because they were highly prized because they were intelligent and they could use them for a variety of different things, okay? That's how the Romans looked at it. Okay, Galatians 3 and verse 26. So, since the faith has come, we are no longer under a pedagogos, under a tutor or a guardian. Verse 26, because you are all sons of God through the faith in Christ Jesus. We're all sons of God through the faith in Christ Jesus. The word in Christ Jesus, you know, oftentimes we read right over this, for, uh, but the Greek word for in is the Greek en, n. Very close, okay, just one letter difference even in spelling in English. It means in the realm of, through the faith in the realm of Christ Jesus. That is, in the condition or state in which something operates from the inside or from within. See, we're all sons of God through the, the faith in Christ Jesus because of this inner persuasion that comes into us and those who are converted by God's presence of God's Holy Spirit. So since the faith has come, we're no longer under our guardian, but we're, we're all sons of God through the faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, For as many of you who were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. And you think about this. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. These incredible divisions in the ancient world Jew or Greek, I mean, talk about differences. These were far greater differences in the ancient world, bond or free, than, they, than this, the division between black and white in modern-day America. I've got news for you. For you, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, which is found in this big book, this, this everlasting covenant of how we are to live. It all comes from the Torah. 
That's where it's primarily found, and then the prophets expanded upon it. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seeds and heirs according to the promise because you put on Christ and so it doesn't matter what your ethnic background or your gender background or any of that stuff. It's irrelevant. I want to mention, you know, when I was a young man and lived in L.A. and was working in L.A., and I spent a lot of time in the black communities of L.A. Sometimes, you know, I'd be the only white person around for miles. And I could collect rents and do stuff. You know, the, I wouldn't go in buildings where the police wouldn't go. I'm serious. I really did. Now, when I knocked on the door, I stood to the side in case a couple of bullets came flying out the door. I did. <laughs> but this is the kind of place where if somebody took off for a weekend, they might come back and find their house, you know, their apartment totally cleaned out because a neighbor broke through the wall and stole all the stuff and then, you know, hit the road. <laughs> it was a dangerous part of time. But at the time, the congregation of the church I was attending was pastored by a man named Abner Washington. Okay. He was black. In fact, the congregation was probably... 97 or 98 percent black. My wife and I, we were, you know, the cream and the coffee. <laughs> and we got to know these people very well. We really did. You see, when you, when you are one in the faith of Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter. Because you see things differently. You see the Spirit of God in action. We helped their kids. We took them to summer camps, and many of these kids had never been out of the inner city, out of the ghetto. We took them and tried to show them something in a bigger part of the world. It was dangerous areas. I had to take some kids back one time because their dad had been murdered. They were black. He was murdered by another black man. He operated a little ice cream truck, and he had, and I think they stole, they killed him for $5 and change beginning of his work day. Five bucks in quarters and nickels and dimes. <laughs> Had nothing to do with race. <laughs> it really didn't. Well, we are now in the time frame prophesied about in 2 Timothy chapter 3. What would Christ have us think about, you know, this week's events in the U.S. of A? What would he have us think about this? Let's go to Luke. Gospel of Luke, chapter 13 and verse 1. Gospel of Luke, chapter 13 and verse 1. Gospel of Luke, chapter 13 and verse 1. Essentially, this is a section. You know, this God, you know, this particular, if you were making little notes, you say, this scripture is about an exhortation to change your hearts. Okay, uh, Luke chapter 13 and uh, verse 1. At that time... Some people were told, uh, at that time, some people were told, uh, told Jesus that Pilate, Pilate, Pontius Pilate, he was the Roman governor of Judea during this period of time, 26 AD, uh, 36 AD, 10 years. Um, he was the Roman governor of Judea. The Judeans, the Jews of the Holy Land, if you were, the land of promise, they were a conquered subject people. They didn't have much in the way of civil rights. They were definitely second class and inferior. They were told to pay their taxes and do what they are told and shut up. Okay, it was, you know, the Romans didn't treat them very nicely. Anyways, it was told Jesus by some of the people that Pilate had killed some Jews from Galilee while they were worshiping. He mixed their blood with the blood of the animals they were sacrificing to God. Talk about a bad cop. You know, they, they were going up to this place and, you know, whatever it was, somebody didn't like their looks or they didn't like what somebody said. Paul had them slaughtered. Verse 2, Jesus answered, Do you think this happened to them? Okay, because they were more sinful than all others in Galilee. 
okay, because such a bad thing happened to these, you know, these Jews who went up to worship at the temple and then they were slaughtered by, by Pilate's guys, Pilate's, you know, soldiers. He said, no, verse, Jesus said in verse 3, no, I tell you, unless you change your hearts and lives, which is what is encompassed by the word repent. You see, you have to change your hearts and lives. The people of the United States must repent. They really must. They must change their hearts and lives. They must repent. Unless you change your hearts and minds, if, unless you repent, you will all be destroyed as they were. That's Jesus' warning. There's no war like a civil war, let me tell you that right offhand. Anybody who knows anything about the history of the United States of America will, uh, you know, will know that the war in which the most amount of Americans ever died was the Civil War. My family lived through it. They fought on both sides of that war. Both sides. It's terrible. Everything that I learned, you know, it's terrible. Even if you look at the old pictures, 150 years old, they still look terrible. Unless you change your hearts and minds, unless you repent, you will be destroyed as they were. That's Jesus. what Jesus has to say, verse 4. What about those 18 people who died when the tire, tower of Siloam fell on them? Okay, bad, shoddy construction job. Some contractor skimped on the mortar. <laughs> Use something cheap. <laughs> Do you think they were more sinful? greater offenders than all the others who live in Jerusalem. No, I tell you, but unless you change your hearts and lies, and that's what repent means, you will all be destroyed too. That's a sober warning. Unless we repent, we're going to be destroyed. And that's, that's true of each of us individually, but it's true of a whole country and a whole nation like the United States of America. It's true of Canada too. Absolutely true of Canada and every other country. You know, one of the things we must let go is the feeling of having to take it upon ourselves to retaliate against someone's injustice. These days, especially because of media manipula manipulation, you know, literally throwing Girl Scout water on a fire, okay, these days, especially, you know, because of that, we don't know, you don't know, you don't, what is the whole story? Have you got just a selected tidbits of the story? Or maybe it's a completely twisted, you know, inside out part of the story. Believe me, that goes on. The, mini, the media does manipulate. It does. Jesus had something to say about this. And there are a lot of angry people running around, as, as one of those news comments meant. And they were, where, you know, they were concerned about the state of humanity. Well, we need to get this straight. If you are a child of God, you, you know, we're living in perilous times, you must get this straight. You must hear the words of your Savior. And he's not just your Savior, he's also your Lord, if you're a Christian. That means he's your boss. And he tells you what to do. You may not like that. You may not like having a boss. Christ is your boss. He is the head of the church. If you're a Christian, he's your boss. He tells you what to do. He really does. Matthew 5 and verse 38. Let's go to the expanded Bible version here. Verse 38, Matthew, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. We all know that saying, don't we? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You know, it's cited, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, actually it's cited three times in the Old Covenant Hebrew Scriptures, Exodus 21.4 and Deuteronomy 19.21, you know. But you know, and one of the things you notice there, this eye for eye and tooth for a tooth, is always in the context of instructions are being given to people who were entrusted with the job of being a judge. Officially, they were judges. That was their status. You know, these days we have them sitting on a, dia, a raised dais and with black robes and whatever, all here, here, you hear, police rise before the honorable judge or whatever it might be. Yes, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is instruction for judges. It's talking about equity. 
I want to look at one of these cases. Let's go to um, in the book of Ex, uh, the book of Leviticus. Very interesting here. The book of Leviticus, and we're going to go to Leviticus chapter twenty-four. Right after this numeration of what all the feast days that are contained in the Bible, you know, God's holy time, we have in verse uh, we have in chapter twenty-four. And let's see, in verse 17, we're going to start here in verse 17. That is Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 17. And he who kills any man shall surely be put to death. You know the Ten Commandments said, thou shalt not kill. Okay, there's not a lot of if, ands, and buts in it, okay? You'll find out later on when you read the scriptures, there was the state, those, the king, those who were responsible, had an obligation, okay, there was something that God required the officials who were in charge of the community to maintain order, to, and if someone killed someone, you see this right after the time of Noah's flood, God was going to require their shed blood. But of course, we don't have really, uh, people think it's terrible to have capital punishment anymore, all the, all the loony lefties who want to deny what God had to say, and so we don't have justice, and so people have problems. Anyways, and, and here in chapter 24 and verse 17, And he who kills any man shall surely be put to death. And he who kills uh, an animal shall make it good, animal for animal. There's the eye for eye and tooth for tooth. And if a man physically maims his neighbor as he has done, so shall it be done to him. Break for break, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Most commentators say that this was money. Okay, that was, in, no, that was included. But it doesn't say that here specifically. If he has caused a blemish in the man, it shall be done to him. And he who kills an animal shall restore it, and he who kills a man shall be put to death. Okay, that's pretty clear. <laughs> but of course, we don't like to think about that. This, you know, God is too hard on us. You know, we, we can't do that sort of thing. We have somebody kill 40 or 50 people. We've just got to lock them up and you know, feed them for the next 30 years. No, anyways. Uh, verse 22. God makes this point here. I'm talking about eye for eye and tooth for tooth. One judgment shall be for you, whether for a stranger or for one of your own country, for I am the Lord your God. See, God has one standard of justice. It didn't matter whether you're an Israelite or non-Israelite. It didn't matter where you came from. God's country was all done <laughs> according to the law. And there was one standard for everyone. It didn't matter who you were. Anyways, let's go back to Matthew. Matthew uh, 5, and uh, you know, I was, as you've heard us said, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Okay, verse 39, Matthew 5, 39. Okay, after you've heard this and you see where it was cited from, and Jesus quoted from the Mosaic law. Verse 39, but I tell you, don't stand up against, that is, don't resist, don't retaliate against an evil person. Now, Jesus is speaking to an audience who were not in power. These were your ordinary Joes and Sarahs. Okay, don't take upon yourself that you have to settle the score. But I tell you, don't stand up against an evil person. If someone slaps or strikes you on the right cheek, and the expanded Bible says, you know, whether it's an insult or an act of violence, turn to him the other cheek also. We all know this one. We've heard this. How often do you hear our politicians talking about this these days? If someone wants to sue you in court to take your tunic, your shirt, let him have your coat also. If someone forces you to go with him one mile, go with him two miles. And Jesus is referring to a practice that was come. That all the Judeans, all the people living in Galilee knew that because they were occupied by the Roman army. And they had a rule that they could impress you. They could come along and you're there and say, come, you're going to carry my pack, all my stuff. 
you know, the armed military, when they go into battle, when they used to in Afghanistan or some of these places, you know, it's 60 pound packs. And they had, you know, it was the law, the, the custom that the Romans could make, a, if you were a Jew, you're going to be my mule. Okay, Jew, you're going to be my mule. And Jesus saying to him, if someone forces you to go one mile with them, go with them too. <laughs> Actually say, I'll do another one for you. What is that showing? The Roman would look at him like, what? <laughs> I'm treating you like dirt. <laughs> and, and, you know, of course, and as you walk along, all of a sudden you're t you probably talk. After a while, he's curious. He discovers you're a human being. The Romans started learning, these Jews, well, they're not quite, you know, just, I thought they were just all donkeys, you know, but they're not quite that bad. Verse 42, if someone asks for something, give him. Don't refuse it to give it. Someone who wants to borrow from you, okay? And verse 43, you have heard that it has been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Cited from Leviticus 19.18. But I say to you, what does Jesus say? Love your enemies and pray for those who hurt you. Pray for those who persecute you. If you do this, you will be true children of your Father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on evil people and on good. And he sends the rain to those who do right and those who do wrong. You know, the just and whether you're just or righteous or unjust and unrighteous. You know, we're in this community where I live. We have all sorts here. Sun comes up, the rain falls down, we all get it. We all share because we're living here. If you love only those people who love you, you will get no reward. Even the tax collectors do that. <laughs> Even the politicians love those who love them. But he's saying we've got to be better. We've got to do more than that. If you are nice only to your friends, you're no better than other people. Even those who don't know God. You know, they know enough to be nice. The point was, is, you know, the expanded Bible says the Gentiles and pagans knew you're nice to people who are nice to you. They knew that. Even the, the lofty demon crats, if, if you allow me to have a little fun with that, know to do that. And the most secular people in the world, you know, whatever, sometimes know how to treat people nicely, be polite. Even those who don't know God are nice to their friends. Verse 48, so what? Jesus is saying here, verse 48, therefore, so therefore you must be perfect. Just as your Father in heaven is perfect. The Greek word here for perfect is that, you know, we love this word, teleos. You must be mature, fully consummated in your ethical and moral development. From going through the, all the necessary age, uh, stages to reach that end goal of being perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. It's going through all the necessary process in this spiritual journey we call life. We, this, is, this, is, this is what Jesus is asking us to be, to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Let's go to James, half-brother of Jesus Christ, had the same mother. Catholics don't believe that, but that's what the Bible says. James chapter 1 and verse 2. James chapter 1 and verse 2, the Amplified Version. James, who, who was also the head of the, the Jerusalem Church of God, an apostle, said, Consider it nothing but joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you fall into various trials. You have difficulties. Be assured that the testing of your faith, the experiences that you have, produces endurance, which is leading to that spiritual maturity and inner peace because you're going, you're, you're successfully walking the spiritual journey. Verse 4, and let endurance have its perfect result and do a thorough work so that you may be perfect and completely developed. Completely developed in our faith, in the faith of Jesus Christ, lacking nothing. Let's go to 1 Peter. So we, we have James. Let's go to Peter. 1 Peter chapter, uh, the, the first Peter, the, the epistle of 1 Peter, and chapter 1, verse 13. 
Let's take this one in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be serious and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Payday. For a Christian, the revelation of Jesus Christ is payday. It's reward day. It's judgment day for the household of faith. And a good thing. See, we're, because, you know, it's a good thing if, if we're walking in faith, you know, and we're diligent with this, we, we can look forward to it. 14, as obedient children. See, not like as, as, as Paul later warned Timothy, you know, people were disobedient to parents. We're obedient to our heavenly father, to our elder brother, Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, the apostle Peter is saying, be holy because I am holy. He's citing this from Leviticus. Actually, he, there were three places in, in the book of Leviticus in the law of, of Moses that he could have cited this from. Leviticus 11, 44 to 45, Leviticus 19 and verse 2, and Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 7. <laughs> of course, the Leviticus is a book written to priests. See, God's church, Peter later says, we're going to be kings and priests in the, for, for serving Jesus Christ. So we are to be holy as he is holy. Peter felt it was good to cite the law of Moses in this, the Torah. Now, you remember the scripture I cited earlier in 2 Timothy 3, 5, where it talked about holding a form of outward godliness. That is, holding a form of a godly religion, although they have denied its power. And, they, and the Amplified says they deny its power because the, their conduct nullifies their, their claims of faith. How they behave nullifies the fact that what they say, that they are somehow professing the true religion. Too many people like to go through life in this, in, in this world right now thinking a lawless grace that, you know, somehow, you know, it's, it's a, you know, I say the right words and Christ forgives me and then I can be as rotten as I want and I don't have to pay attention. No, that's not what, that's, that's not what the Bible teaches. There are many today who have been calling themselves ministers of Christ in the United States of America. I mean, that's the most religious country in the world professing they're Christians. But they're teaching us the law of God, deriding it as the law of Moses and calling it saying it's done away with in the New Covenant Scriptures, in the New Testament. Yet as I could have already been showing you, Jesus and the apostles quoted abundantly. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17. Let's hear the words of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Matthew 5, 17, Amplified. It was interesting, the ancient Celtic Christians, this was one of their major you know, proof texts or one of their defining texts as well. Anybody who is a scripturalist who takes the Bible seriously is going to look at this and it's going to change their worldview and their vision. It's going to change their understanding of Christianity. Be able to separate those who you know, profess a form of godliness uh, outwardly but uh, deny its power. We'll understand who these people are if we pay attention. Matthew 5 and verse 17, Jesus said, words of Jesus Christ, do not think that I came to do away or undo the law of Moses. This is amplified. Or the writings of the prophets. And not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For I assure you and most solemnly say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, and obviously it has not passed away, Right? Not the smallest letter or stroke of the pen will pass from the law until all things which it foreshadows are accomplished. These are the last days. All sorts of stuff is, going, is, is, is about to break out and hit the fan. <laughs> People are worried about it because obviously you know, more stuff's happening these days. Verse 19, so Jesus continues. So whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments, that is one of the shortest of them, such as do not kill, do not steal, you know, this sort of thing, 
what they whatever they think is the least of God's commands, and I wouldn't want to be in the position to say that's the least. That's not as important. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. If you want to do it, if you want to tread that way, be my guest. <laughs> I'm looking forward to the time of Christ's return and judgment. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna look for it and, and, and break out in highs because I'm scared to death about it. So whoever breaks one of these uh, least of these commandments, whatever they think is that least, and teaches others to do the same, will be called least, the least important in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches them, he will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I hope you want to be called great in the kingdom of heaven. If you are a preacher of the word of God, I hope you want to be called great in the kingdom of heaven instead of the least. You know, Paul talks about vessels, some that are fitted for honor and some that are fitted for dishonor. Chamber pots. Do you want to be a chamber pot in the kingdom of heaven? Verse 20. For I say to you, Jesus goes on, that unless your righteousness, that is your uprightness, you know, your moral ethics, your, your behavior is more than that of the scribes and Pharisees. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's interesting the Celtic Christians understood that, you know, a Christian, his righteousness could exceed the scribes and Pharisees because we also have the law that's, that Christ mentioned and laid out and explained to us as well as the apostles. That's the reason why we can be, you know, more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees who knew backwards and forwards. But, of course, they didn't do it. <laughs> They were hypocrites. Jesus oftentimes called them hypocrites because they'd say they didn't do. Unless our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 21, you've heard it was said to the men of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders shall be guilty. Word can here also be translated liable before the court. And we heard already, I already read it there in Leviticus. If you murder a man, your life is forfeit. You, you know, if you shed somebody's blood, yours is due. You shall not murder. Not a whole lot of exceptions in this. If you're an official judge and you know, charge of the law of the land and somebody comes before you who's done things worthy of death, you're supposed to administer the law. But as an average person just walking the streets, we don't have that responsibility. You don't, and I don't. Those who do should exercise it. Those who don't, it's murder. You're liable before the court of God. But I say to you, everyone who continues to be angry with his brother or harbors malice against them shall be guilty before the court. Can't hate somebody because of the color of their skin. Jesus is comparing it to if you know it's just if you're angry and you and you and you're harboring malice, like the shooter in 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 Dallas, he was harboring malice against the officers who were there to guard the Black Lives Matter parade. Anyways, he was harboring malice. He he was liable before the court, <laughs> and, and you know they 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 said in the little robot, boom boom. That was a first in America. And whoever speaks, and, and the amplified says contemptuously or insultingly, whoever speaks in contemptuously or insultingly to his brother, raka, you empty-headed idiot, is the way the amplified puts it. That's the sense. You shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be in danger of fiery hell. Gehenna. The Greek version of the Hebrew Valley of Hinnom, you know, where they used to burn the garbage. <laughs> Verse 23. So if you're presenting your offering at the altar, and while there you remember that your brother has something, a grievance or some sort of legitimate complaint against you, leave your offering there at the altar and go. First make peace with your brother and then come and present your offering to God. Jesus is saying we can't go around, you know, offending and being nasty and mean, rotten to the core, you know, and have any sort of relationship with him. 
and to be able to have the hope of the covenants of promise and of eternal life. You know, in his comments, the mayor of Dallas, Texas, he actually touched on it. He, he said something that really, you know, he, he, he mentioned something about how the hatreds and divisions in the USA can be healed. He, he, he put his finger on it. Too bad he didn't preach a whole sermon about it. It, especially when he had the national news media sitting there. He should have preached a whole sermon to it. You might have gotten some snippets actually covered. And for a nation that's turning aside from God, it might have given some people a clue of what's going on and what the solutions are. Gun control isn't going to change the situation. I don't care how strict the laws are and you send your police around everybody's home to collect guns. It's not going to change the situation. Let's see where the mayor of Dallas and what he said that he got right. He touched on it briefly. Most people probably didn't catch it at all. Matthew 22, Matthew 22 and verse 35. Matthew 22 and verse 35. Again in the Amplified. One of them, Jesus is being questioned. You know, he talked about, you know, he'd have his press conferences, he'd have his scrums with the, these guys who all of these critics who were looking to find fault with him. One of them, a lawyer, that is, he is an expert in Mosaic law. That's what, a, that's what a lawyer meant in that context of that society. One of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, here was Jesus' prime time opportunity to say, hey, your occupation is going to become redundant and you're going to be out of work because the law will soon become irrelevant. People don't need to hear about God's law. Just do whatever. You know, go for those warm, fuzzy feelings about, you know, even if the brutality, violence, don't worry. You don't have to worry about what those harsh old writings in the Bible about God's law or messages given by the prophets, you know, said. Who needs God's law? Aren't we all already perfect already? We already have achieved the apex of ethical reasoning now in the 21st century. If you think about it from the standpoint of the modern media, I mean, just do your own thing. Isn't that producing going to produce everything that's wonderful and good in our society? They say there's no such thing as an absolute right or wrong. It's all just relativistic shades of gray. Just do your thing. That's where our society is. Why are we in trouble? Our leaders need to think seriously. The situation is bad because they're not leading right. They really aren't. They're leading the nation into big time trouble. Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus replied to him, he said, what's the greatest commandment in the law? See, Jesus is going to give him an answer. He's not going to say, don't worry about it. Jesus replied to him, what? What is the greatest commandment in the law? What is it? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And he's citing the Mosaic law in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. The greatest thing that the law says is you've got to love. First, you love God, the God of the Bible, with all your heart, soul, and mind. That's the first thing the society, these modern societies in the Western world are violating. Because they're not teaching the people to do that. They don't teach in the schools. They don't, whatever. And they, how much do you hear that? Did anybody, after, after this, these terrible slaughters, talk about that? Verse 38, and this is the first and greatest commandment. It is. Because if we love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and we put our noses into this book, we'd realize we have to do better. We'd realize what the standards really are. How to treat a fellow neighbor. Because in verse 39, he says the second is like it. It's like this greatest commandment of loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why is the second like it? Because Humanity was created in the image and likeness of God. He 
See, God wants us to be his children. <laughs> so if we're going to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, it almost makes sense to, to, to love those who are going to be his children. Doesn't it? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Amplified says that is unselfishly seek the best and highest good for others. If the police walked around and did that, they'd be slower on the draw. If all sorts of other people knew this, they wouldn't be out there just popping off anybody that they, they feel like. The United States would be a totally different country. Of course, when Jesus cited, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, he was quoting from the Mosaic Law from Leviticus 19.18. <laughs> but of course if you say the law the Mosaic law is done away with you have a problem don't love your neighbor as, as yourself hate them that's what we've got right now all those who are professing religion but won't teach the word of God have got a problem they have a form of it but they're denying the power to change people's lives and to change people's lives we're talking about loving your neighbor as yourself that's what the mayor of Dallas, Texas was saying we need to Love our neighbors. Should have preached a sermon of it to, 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 to all those unbelievers in the media who are right there. Well, friends and brethren, we're living indeed in perilous times. Let's remember what Jesus said was the greatest commandment and the second that is like it. At the same time, when we're offended and angered by what someone else is doing, or alleged to have been doing. Let's remember this. Let's remember one more scripture. Go to this New Covenant scripture. <laughs> Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. If we did just this one scripture, We'd fix America and, and all this, what's this, this mess that's currently broken out in here this past week. This is one. Romans 12, 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Don't call the police in 911, have them come out there and they open the door and you start, you know, banging away at them with your handgun, like this guy did in the South. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave the way open for God's wrath, that is, his judicial righteousness. Because God will judge. He will. For it is written, that is, it's written in the scripture, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. You don't have to take it upon yourself. If you had this one idea, we'd avoid a lot of heartache right now. If we can start with that and then move to love your neighbor as yourself, how much farther we go along. You know, it's interesting. When the Apostle Paul is citing authoritatively this statement, he's quoting Mosaic Law, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 35. And he, in quoting this, you know, this scripture is binding, Mosaic Law, on binding on New Testament Christians, whatever your race or ethnic background or perceived slights, whatever it might be. Brethren and friends, all lives matter to God. The mess in the USA can be fixed if we just turn back to our God and do what Jesus said, repent, or likewise you will all perish. <laughs>